The ship was ploughing majestically through huge seas. When she buried her nose into a particularly large wave, the wind would whip the spray across the flight deck. It was a wild and wonderful scene. Bracing myself on the heaving deck, I took the salty air deep into my lungs, purging my body of the claustrophobic funk of the lower decks. After days below it felt great. The ship was moving about wildly in all directions, and only with effort could we retain our balance. After carefully checking the engines on our planes, we began loading the bombs. A dolly was used to move the bomb under the plane where it was jacked up and attached to the release mechanism. The cradle was then lowered slightly, and my backseater pulled the release to make sure it was operating correctly. Now we knew the release was functioning properly, and that the bomb would come away when we wanted it to. I could only admire the splendid job done by Ichiro Yamada did in overseeing this immensely complex job. In fact, everyone, the mechanics, armourers and everyone else, was working full tilt to ensure that every task was properly carried out. Our launch was scheduled for 30 minutes before sunrise. The ship was completely blacked out, and you couldn't even see the face of the person in front of you. If you needed someone, you had to yell out their name to find them. Looking out at the other ships, I could see that they were all busily light signalling. I had a smoke just before we launched. It tasted indescribably good and somehow calmed my nerves. All aircrew form up, came the announcement and we all lined up on the deck below the bridge. We synchronised our watches and were given our ship's exact position. My navigator Kanai wrote the information down and said, Midway's only 180 miles away. I looked over his shoulder at his map board and was surprised at how deeply we had penetrated into enemy waters. I tensed up even more when I realised that we would be there in less than an hour. In the pre-dawn light I could just make out the kindly face of Captain Yanagimoto. He was a warm-hearted leader who cared deeply for his men. There were very few like him in our navy. Once, in the officers' quarters, he said that the ship's crew received awards based on the accomplishments of the flight crews, a statement that really angered the chief quartermaster. We, however, were deeply flattered that he thought so highly of us pilots. His final words to us were, I pray for the success of your mission. With dawn now creeping over the horizon, we ran off to our respective airplanes, hopped in and strapped in tightly. I used the speaking tube to check that my navigator and radio man were ready. Then I signalled the launch officer that we were good to go. The Zeros were already roaring off the deck ahead of us. The thunder of their engines shattered the morning calm and reverberated across the sea. I could see the planes launching from the other carriers as well. Then it was my turn. The launch officer waved his white flag. I brought the engine up to full power and we were off. Out of the corner of my eye I could see Captain Yanagimoto waving his white cap for us as we thundered past the bridge. OK, Captain, I thought to myself. We are on our way. But fate is cruel. That was the last time I would ever see the captain. As pilots, our fate was just as certain. We knew that we would fall from the sky for our country. After launching, we all formed up over Akagi at 3,000 feet, then set off southwards towards Midway. Simultaneously, seven scout planes also launched to search for the enemy fleet. By now, it was completely light, and we turned off our navigation lights. From my spot as lead plane in the second section, I could look back and see the two planes behind me as we thundered over the ocean. Before long, the burning disk of the sun rose up over the horizon to my left and ignited the sky in a spectacular Pacific sunrise. From our cruising altitude of 12,000 feet, I could see the 36 dive bombers out in front of us, and behind us, our 36 attack planes. Around us were the Zeros, guarding us from danger like a mother duck shepherding a flock of ducklings. The dive bombers held formation slightly above us, and the giant bombs attached to their bellies were clearly visible. As usual, though, droning along in formation was boring. Below us, the Eastern Pacific stretched away to infinity in all directions. There wasn't a ship in sight. For those of us who entrusted our lives to airplanes, the tenuous nature of this relationship was never more clearly defined. I had been away from the front for some time and was tensed up and ready for battle. As usual, though, I felt that while others might die, I would not. Human nature is funny that way. On we went our engines purring contentedly. After about 50 minutes, the island of Midway began to take shape on the horizon ahead of us. The Zeros dropped their external fuel tanks to ready themselves for action. Suddenly, one of the dive bombers in front of me burst into flames and fell from formation. 
An enemy fighter had nailed him. Shit. They were up there waiting for us. Six of the Zeros behind us immediately shot to the front of the formation. In another ten minutes we would be over the island. Out of the corner of my eye I could see a vicious dog fight underway, but we kept right on going. Looking over my shoulder, I could see that Hosoda had a death grip on his 7.7mm machine gun, ready to ward off enemy fighters. Here comes a Grumman, he yelled. I looked back to see flames spitting from the fighter's six guns. It looked like the leading edge of his wing was on fire. The Grumman seemed like a very small machine to be crossing swords with our imposing and stately attack planes. We tightened up our formation so as to be able to better concentrate our fire. Then all we could do was wait for the Zeros to come to our rescue. For some reason, none of them did. Hell, we still had to carry out our attack. If we got shot down now, it would all be for nothing. Suddenly, a Grumman appeared in front of our formation. Crap, now we are done for, was all I could think. They knew we didn't have any forward-firing guns, so they made frontal attacks. When they couldn't knock us down from the front, they came at us from below. Before I knew it, there was another one shooting at me from the left. Damn, I hated their guts, but I had to give them credit. They came to fight. Now we are finished, was all I could think. That thought had no sooner formed than a zero flashed over the top of us like a bullet. Yea, go get them. We watched with bated breath as the zeros latched on the tails of the enemy planes. A few seconds later, one of the Grummans suddenly pitched forward and went spinning down towards the ocean. Thank you, Zeros. We only needed three more minutes before we could drop our bombs. Just then, another Grumman came diving down at us from the upper right. He's going to nail us, I yelled, but yelling was all I could do as I had to maintain formation at all costs. Strangely enough, I wasn't afraid or worried about dying, and since there was nothing I could do about it, I just tried to ignore him. In the next instant, he too went spinning down trailing smoke and flame, another victim of our skillful Zero pilots. My number three had apparently been shot up. His left wing was down, but he soon straightened out and rejoined our formation. Hang in there. Our fighters had already knocked down two enemy fighters, and they now climbed up after a third. By now, I had completely forgotten about my own danger, and found myself wildly cheering on the Zeros. They got him. They got another one. Hey, look! I shouted. The pilot bailed out. A few seconds later, a white parachute blossomed above him like a flower, and he floated gently down to the sea. Lucky guy, I thought. He escaped with his life. It was, in fact, a brilliant escape. However, unlike the enemy, those of us in the attack groups wore no parachutes. This was to avoid the lifelong shame of saving ourselves only to be captured by the enemy. We now peeled off in our dive. There was a lot of anti-aircraft fire coming up at us, but the shells were all exploding away from us. You are never going to hit us with that lousy shooting, I thought. At the centre of the island was a single runway running east and west. To its right, on the island's north side, were three hangars. To the left was a lot of greenery that looked like a pine forest. That's where the anti-aircraft emplacement seemed to be, as I could see the flash of gunfire between the trees. Our six planes in the third section dove down from the east side of the island from an altitude of 12,000 feet. The dive bombers were dropping their 500-pounders on the hangars, causing huge fires to erupt. Ichiro Tada, the rear gunner in the flight leader's plane, raised his right hand straight up in the air. We were on our bomb run. It seemed to be taking forever, but we only had about ten seconds to go before release. Ready? On the signal from the lead plane, we all released our bombs at once. Freed of the heavy load, the engine suddenly began to run more easily. Looking down to see how we did, I could see the first four bombs detonate in quick succession right on the runway. Number five went into the pine forest next to the runway, as did six and seven. Nuts, I thought. They missed. Just then, a huge explosion erupted from the forest, and all the anti-aircraft fire stopped. Luck of the draw. Sometimes you screw up, and it works out in your favour. It looked like we made direct hit not just on their anti-aircraft emplacements, but on an ammo dump as well. Secondary explosions were still going off, and flame and debris were flying in all directions. Looking down on the fireworks, I felt a great sense of relief at having successfully done my duty. As we came off the run, we made a big sweeping turn to the west, joined up with the other planes and headed back to our ships. After about an hour, I was able to make out our fleet steaming grandly along ahead of us. The sight filled me with relief home at last. 
It felt great to see the fleet there on the horizon after the successful completion of our mission. Before I knew it, I was humming a popular melody. Yep, there's no place like home. In this relaxed state of mind, I aimed my plane towards our carrier and flew along enjoying the view. Still, I thought, those Grumman put up quite a fight. This was the first time since the start of the Greater East Asian War that we had faced this enemy plane, so I suppose that's to be expected. Those American pilots were pretty good. Suddenly, one of our destroyers started belching black smoke, the signal that enemy planes had been sighted. Looks like they were out for revenge. Seeing the smoke, I immediately tensed up. OK, let's fight, I thought to myself. I became very excited. We dropped down to 600 feet and got inside our fleet's protective ring. I figured they must be carrier planes, but when I looked up, I saw five B-17 aircraft flying over our ships. At that instant, at least ten huge geysers of water shot up from the right side of Hiryu. This happened right in front of us, and the columns of water completely obscured the carrier from sight. Damn, they got her! I yelled to the guys behind me, but when the water subsided, there was steaming along at full speed as majestically as ever. Thank goodness, I thought with relief. But where were the Zeros that were supposed to be providing cover? They could at least have knocked a couple down by ramming them. What the hell were they doing? I had no sooner finished this thought than one of the destroyers at the edge of the fleet starting pumping out black smoke. Looking off to the east, I saw what looked like a bunch of baby spiders crawling along the surface sea. It was a formation of enemy torpedo planes spread out and flying low over the water. They were headed straight for the fleet. Our fighters were chasing after them and gaining fast. One of the enemy planes released its torpedo, and I could see its track heading straight for the bow of Soryu. I held my breath and waited for the impact that was certain to come. At that instant, the ship leaned steeply to the left. The bow went right and the torpedo sped harmlessly by, missing by what seemed like only inches. That's the way to do it, I thought. Go Soryu. The enemy torpedo planes bored in courageously, but they had no chance against the Zeros. Each enemy plane had one or two Zeros on its tail. These were the same 36 Zeros that took part in the Midway raid, so there were more Zeros than enemy torpedo planes. Fire flashed from their guns and one after another the enemy planes began crashing into the sea. As each plane impacted the water there was a huge explosion and large waves emanated from the impact zone, leaving nothing behind. I watched in morbid fascination as each enemy plane met the same fate. The Zeros truly ruled the skies. A torpedo plane doesn't stand a chance against a fighter. Without fighter cover, they were nothing more than helpless victims. Even though they were the enemy, as a torpedo pilot myself, I couldn't help but pity them. I felt a deep respect for their bravery. By this time, the B-17 aircraft had flown away, and the first attack was over. There seemed to have been about 40 enemy torpedo planes in the attack, and only three or four of them made it back to their ships. We were all terribly proud of the splendid performance of our Zeros. Truly, they were without equal, not only was the plane itself superior, but our pilots were hardened veterans from the Chinese campaigns. Their fighting spirit was an inspiration to us all, according to the famous ace Saburo Sakai, when he departed for an attack, he always planned exactly how many minutes he would fight. When he was over enemy territory, as soon as the battle began, he would look at his watch and confirm how much time he had left. Even when there were 50 or 60 planes involved in a huge dogfight, the outcome was usually decided in two or three minutes. After that, it was just a matter of chasing the enemy planes or heading home. In the air, victory or defeat was always decided in a matter of minutes. In fact, during the battle over Midway, I couldn't always distinguish between friend and foe. Airplanes were falling in flames and the sky was dotted with parachutes, some planes simply blew up, others went spinning down trailing black smoke. I figured that plenty of our planes must also have been shot down, but when we rendezvoused after the battle, I was astonished to see that all 36 Zeros were still there. It was amazing how dominant the Zero was. Still, the truth of the matter was that only some of the pilots were true veterans. They were the leaders, and they were the ones that knocked down most of the enemy planes. Their other task was to teach the younger pilots how to fight, I heard somewhere that the enemy pilots were ordered not to take on the Zero unless the odds were two to one, or better in their favour. This gives some idea of what a fearsome opponent they were. None of our ships were damaged in the attack, 
but we were running so low on fuel that if we didn't get down soon, we would be landing in the ocean. We waited impatiently, one eye on our fuel gauges as the fighters landed, then we got down in a hurry. As soon as we landed, we gathered beneath the bridge where we were debriefed on our attack. Meanwhile, the ground crews swarmed over our planes, moving them into the hangars for rearming and refueling. With the armourers, fuelers, mechanics and pilots running all over the place, the ship was an absolute madhouse of frenetic activity. The tempo was set by the constant clanging of the elevator bells as they went up and down lowering the planes into the hangars. The 18 attack planes that had remained on the ship were already loaded with 500 pounds bombs and were lined up in rows in the main hangar. On our next attack I would be carrying a torpedo. The problem was our magazine was located deep inside the ship and the torpedoes could only be lifted up one at a time. This made for very hard work for our torpedo men. During our debriefing beneath the bridge, we learned the details of the enemy's first attack. At the same time that we took off this morning, a scout plant launched from the cruiser tone flew off to locate the enemy fleet. However, clouds hampered the crew's vision, preventing them from finding the fleet where we expected it to be. It was at this juncture that the ship received the radio message from Captain Tomonaga, the leader of the midway attack, that a second attack on the island was needed. This set off a renewed frenzy on the carriers Akagi and Kaga, as the torpedoes on their 36 planes were replaced with ground attack bombs. As this work was in progress, another message was received from a different scout plane that they had located the enemy fleet. The message, however, was cut short, probably because the plane had been shot down by enemy fighters. It was then decided that Soryu would launch its only Suisse, the fastest and most advanced dive bomber in the Navy's inventory, and use it as a high-speed scout. It was flown by one of our most skilled and respected pilots, powered by a liquid-cooled engine. The Suisse was faster even than the enemy Grumman. This plane had located the enemy fleet, at which point the order was given to once again remove the ground attack bombs from the torpedo planes on Soryu and Kaga and replace them with torpedoes. And it was during this operation that the enemy's first air attack had taken place. What are those idiots thinking? we grumbled. We ought to just hit those carriers with our 1600 pounds ground bombs. That will make a mess of their flight decks by the time they are done screwing around with scout planes, it's going to be dark. We knew when the tone scout launched, how fast it was and which direction it went, so you didn't have to be a math genius to figure out about where the enemy fleet was. Sending out another scout only wasted time we didn't have. Anyone could figure that out. In war, fortune favours the bold, decisiveness is more important than thoroughness. With all our carriers crammed with bombed-up planes, if the enemy hit us now, we were screwed. Battles are decided in an instant. We needed to take off immediately with torpedoes. But when your luck runs out, there's nothing you can do. One of our outlying destroyers again began to belch black smoke, indicating another enemy air attack. The loudspeakers on the ship blared out the bugle cry to battle stations. Having just landed there was no way we could take off again. We would have to wait until the attack was over. Frustrated beyond words, we traipsed off to the pilot's ready room beneath the bridge. If this attack had happened only ten minutes later, we could have launched all our planes and inflicted heavy damage on the enemy ships. The day couldn't have been any worse. Midway would require another attack. We had been shot up by Grummans, and when we finally make it back to our ship, we get attacked. Back in our tiny ready room, we all sat around and bitched. The loudspeakers were still blaring away with the bugle cry to battle stations. Kaga took a torpedo in her screws, someone said. She is smoking and dead in the water. That was the first piece of bad news to arrive, in fact. At 7.25am, Kaga had taken a hit from a dive bomber and was belching black smoke. My observer Hosoda and four others ran up the flight deck to take a look. Looks like this is going to be a major attack. I thought to myself. The enemy torpedo planes are bound to be back. Suddenly I realised how hungry I was. Better eat something now, I thought, so I started munching on an onigiri and some pickled radish. For some reason they were especially tasty today. Before long the rest of us were all munching contentedly on this traditional navy food. An outsider might think it improper for us to be eating like this in the middle of a battle, but that's the way soldiers are. We were happily chewing away on our onigiri when suddenly the ship was staggered by a tremendous explosion 
and heeled way over to the left. Shit, looks like they got us. Everyone's face suddenly looked very grim, and we stuffed what was left of our onigiri into our mouths. Boom, boom. Two more mighty explosions reverberated throughout the ship. This is bad, someone said. Now we are in for it. At that instant, a huge ball of flame shot into the ready room. The room instantly filled with black smoke, and my headgear was blown off my head. I was sitting on a couch at the back of the room and couldn't breathe. Out was all I could think. We all lunged for the door, but the doorway was wide enough for only one at a time, and we got all jammed up. Get out, we screamed. Hurry, like madmen we scrambled for our lives. But there was nothing to do but wait patiently for my turn as I slowly asphyxiated. No way I am going to die here trapped like a goddamned rat, I thought. I want to die in the sky. Like a rugby player I leaped on top of the bodies in front of me and scrambled over their shoulders. I didn't care whose head and shoulders I was stepping on. I was getting out of there. After getting knocked all over the place I finally made it to the lifeboat deck. It was a narrow space and was crammed with scared and panicked sailors. Once again I fought my way to the top of the crowd and scrambled over the top. Everyone was jammed together like sardines. There wasn't even room to move. Those of us who finally made it up to the flight deck walked into a scene of utter devastation. Explosions were going off left and right. Pieces of airplanes were flying through the air and people were running everywhere. Geez, they are making direct hits on us. Those aren't enemy bombs. That's the 500 pounders on our airplanes cooking off on the hangar deck. Suddenly a wall of flames came rushing towards us. Out on the open deck there was nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. We were trapped. Still, even when all seems lost, you can't just throw up your hands and give up. If we did that, we would soon be burned to a crisp. So we did the only thing possible. We tried to fight the fire as best we could. If we had been on land, we could have assisted the firefighting teams or help evacuate the wounded. But out here in the middle of the ocean, on a flaming flight deck, we were completely helpless. Of course, our pitiful efforts had no effect. Only a sudden wind shift saved us from a nasty death by immolation. Boom, boom. Just then, two thunderous explosions roared out beneath our feet. The ship's firefighting crews were bravely battling the fire and tons of seawater shot from their hoses across the flight deck. But it was no more effective than throwing water on a hot stone Soryu was still churning through the water at full speed. Apparently, the fire had not yet reached the engine room. The engineers must have been working like fiends, feeding the giant engines as much fuel oil as they could handle. Just as I was thinking that we might survive this after all, one of the boilers must have burst because a screaming jet of hot steam started shooting out from the middle right of the ship, and she suddenly began to slow. Now we are really screwed, was all I could think. When we were down on the crowded lifeboat deck, it was impossible to see the fires on the flight deck. But when the ship suddenly slowed, it became clear to all that we were in serious trouble. No doubt I was in a state of shock, as I had never seen anything like this before. Man, I thought, if only we were on land. Sounds stupid, of course, but what could we do out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean? I saw two or three men jump from the rear of the flight deck. They must have been nuts. There wouldn't be any rescue boats coming along for a while. It's at times like this that it's especially important to obey orders. Those guys would surely pay for their insubordination. I remembered looking at a photo shot by one of our dive bomber pilots when we sunk the British carrier Hermes in the Indian Ocean. It looked just the same, but this time it was happening to us. Karmic retribution, by now I had pretty much given up hope and was just waiting to see what would happen next. Just then Isha appeared in front of me. You okay? I asked. Yeah, fine. Man, am I glad to see you. Where were you? What's wrong with you, Maury? I was right there next to you eating onigiri. Oh yeah, I forgot, man. I was really out of it. Must be the shock. I learned that Commander Kohara and Captain Yanagimoto had been on the bridge directing operations when the blast from one of the bomb hits blew them down to the flight deck and broke their legs. Soryu was still moving along at pretty good clip and belching out black smoke but it was merely a matter of time before the fires reached the magazine at the bottom of the ship. Shortly thereafter, Captain Yanagimoto gave the order for all hands to abandon ship. Already a dozen or so nimble fellows had sprung into one of the lifeboats hanging from its crane. One of the lifeboat crew was trying to lower the boat into the sea. But maybe the boat was already too heavy because as soon as he started slacking out the ropes, one rope suddenly became much looser than the other. 
The boat tipped vertically, and everyone in the boat fell into the water. I was standing at the edge of the lifeboat deck, but looking down quelled any desire I might have had to jump. It was about sixty feet to the surface of the sea. That may not sound like much, but it was a long way down. I thought it would be good if a big swell could come by and shorten the distance. Okay, you go first. No, you can go first. I will follow you. For some reason, all the sailors who only moments ago had been scrambling like mad to get ahead of their messmates had become suddenly very polite. I felt bad about leaving poor Soryu like this, but I suppose we just had to accept that it was part of what war was all about. About 2,000 yards to the south, I could see the Kaga and Akagi were also burning fiercely. The sea was completely calm, and the two ships floated unmoving, each under a boiling vertical pillar of thick black smoke. Most of my friends had disappeared. Only two or three remained on the lifeboat deck with me. The only ones left were those who were afraid to jump. Finally, I screwed up my courage, took a deep breath and jumped. When I hit the water, it felt like I was just going to keep on going all the way to the bottom, but I soon popped to the surface. All of us air crew were wearing life vests and they kept us afloat. But I worried about the sailors who didn't have life vests. The wounded must be in real trouble. The lifeboat I had seen earlier was floating right in front of me, so I swam over to it and clambered aboard. There was still no one on it, but it was half filled with seawater, so I took off my flight shoes and used them to bail. Section leader Heijiro Abe was swimming nearby, and I helped him climb aboard. We tried to save as many wounded as possible. Those who were healthy hung onto the sides of the boat or swam alongside. All the wounded suffered from terrible burns. Their faces and arms were horribly disfigured. The boat was soon full, so we wanted to row the wounded to one of the destroyers. But none of them were capable of using the oars, so we allowed three non-wounded on board, and we rowed off to a destroyer as quickly as possible. Ten other healthy swimmers grabbed onto the stern and pushed from behind. Abe was the most experienced sailor on board, so he took the tiller and steered. There were many others clamouring for help as we rowed past, but our boat was already over full, so all we could do was try and deliver the wounded as quickly as possible, then come back for another load. Wait! I yelled. We will be back for you. We finally reached the destroyer Makigumo that was picking up survivors as she headed our way. The wounded were offloaded first, then four healthy guys from the destroyer hopped into the boat, and we climbed up onto the destroyer. As soon as I got onto the deck, all the accumulated tension of the past few hours melted away and I collapsed in a heap. Suddenly I saw Ishida's face right in front of me. Ishida, what are you doing here? After I jumped in the water, someone came down right on top of me and landed on my hip. Now I can't stand up. Try to get some sleep. You should be okay after a few days, I said, like I had suddenly become a doctor. Just then, four guys came over, put Ishida on a stretcher and carried him off. A steady stream of bedraggled survivors arrived at the destroyer. Some were clutching blocks of wood, others were covered in fuel oil, but they all shared one thing in common, a burning desire to live that shone like fire from their eyes. Soryu was now burning furiously. Giant fireballs roiled from the flight deck area, and a huge pillar of black smoke rose up to the heavens. If there is such a thing as hell, I thought, this is what it looks like. Although I had always known that a front-line carrier must sooner or later meet such a fate, the death of Soryu was a terrible sight to see and threw me into a deep depression. We pilots would soon be moving on to exciting new battlefields. But having to sit by and watch my comrades drowning and suffering with grievous wounds, I felt that my heart would truly break. At the same time, I knew that we would be returning to the limitless blue sky, and that thought made me strangely happy. Some 300 survivors were picked up by the destroyer. I couldn't see anyone else out there. My rear gunner Kato had suffered serious burns to his face and hands. Hey, when did that happen? I said in surprise. I wanted to see what was happening to Kaga, so I left the ready room, and as soon as I did, I got hit by a fireball. Since the Hawaii attack, the two of us had done a lot of flying together, and I knew he always did his best. I wondered if he would ever be the same again. Hang in there. You'll be all right? Yeah, sure, I started to crack. Seeing Kato all burned up was the last straw. Tears surged from my eyes and I gave way to my emotions. Why would he have to go look at Kaga, I thought bitterly. 
If he had just stayed in the ready room with the rest of us and eaten his onigiri, he never would have gotten burned. I knew that what was done was done and there was nothing we could do about it now, but I couldn't stop thinking about it. Finally, they picked up the last eight sailors who had remained on board to the very end. I was trying to find my hometown friend Nakajima. I had already walked around among the fifty or so wounded, but he wasn't among them. Hey, did you see Nakajima? I asked of a mechanic. Yeah, we were all down on the hangar deck getting the planes ready when he got it. So how come you survived? I asked. I got called up to the bridge. The bomb hit just after I left. I never saw what happened, but I don't think anyone made it out. So now Nakashima is gone too, I thought. I recalled all the times we spent playing together when we were kids. He was one of those fundamentally good people. He wanted to be a maintenance engineer and make the Navy his career. What a waste, Ishii. Another of our hometown friends had also been wounded. I walked over to his bed and told him about Nagashima. Kiyo was killed too, he said, when I heard that I just closed my eyes. Ishii wounds eventually healed and he returned to the front, only to fall over Saipan Harbour. It was from Abe, who was one of the last to make it onto the destroyer, that we heard about the heroic death of Captain Yanagimoto. The first bomb to hit during the first attack made a direct hit near the ship's bow. The resulting fireball engulfed both the forward flight deck and the bridge. Because the captain was outside on the bridge directing operations, he was seriously burned on the face and legs. Many of the sailors working on the flight deck were also badly burned. In spite of his injuries, the captain remained at his post directing operations until Soryu lost forward motion, at which time he ordered all hands to abandon ship. Commander Kohara, the ship's second-in-command, was also badly injured and left the ship with the ship's doctor. The captain, however, refused to leave. He remained on the compass bridge watching his men abandon ship, left now. Captain, said Abe, it's time to leave. Everyone else has already. Yes, you are right, but stop fooling around. Get off yourself, right? The captain remained motionless on the compass bridge as he said this. The flight deck was utterly devastated. Bombs were still going off in the hangar deck one after another. There wasn't a moment to lose. The magazine could explode at any moment. Abe picked up the captain from behind and took him forcibly him down the ladder. The captain was of medium height and build, but Abe was on the ship's sumo team, so he had little trouble carrying the captain. Wait, said the captain. I cannot abandon one of our nation's most important ships like this. I must share Soryu's fate. That is the proper way. I am truly thankful for your kind intentions, but there are some duties a man simply must carry out. At this, the captain jerked himself free of Abe, knocking Abe down the ladder. A few minutes later, he heard the captain's voice shout from the bridge, for the emperor, Banzai, 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 followed by a pistol shot. Abe was the last person to see Captain Yanagimuto alive. The above comes from Petty Officer Abe's account of the last moments of Captain Yanagimoto. The Akagi, Kaga and Soryu were now all in flames without having made any significant contribution to the battle, and many of their aviators and crewmen were dead. The three carriers floated forlornly on the sea, completely impotent. Fortunately, Hiryu was still unscathed and ready for battle. On board was the second air group led by Rear Admiral Tamun Yamaguchi. Hiryu was now carrying the entire responsibility of the carrier strike force and the Japanese navy on her shoulders. She launched her attack. Her initial strike consisted of 18 dive bombers escorted by six fighters. Each dive bomber carried a single 500 pounds bomb. This group attacked the Yorktown and scored three hits. However, the enemy's fighter defenses were ferocious only five bombers, and three zeros returned. At 9.45 a.m. a second attack was launched consisting of ten torpedo planes escorted by six zeros. We watched our fellow torpedo pilots launch from Hiryu and cheered them on as best we could. But this was terribly frustrating for us. We wanted to join them, but we had no planes to fly. Give them one in the guts for us, we yelled. Come back in one piece. All we could do was pray for their success. Our prayers must have been answered because not long after we received word that they had scored three torpedo hits. But this success had come at a terrible price. The enemy's defences were formidable. They placed their carriers at the centre, with battleships, cruisers and destroyers around them in concentric rings. Outside, the destroyers were the fighters. Our torpedo planes had to first get past the fighters. 
then the destroyers and their murderous curtain of anti-aircraft fire, then somehow evade the fire from the cruisers and battleships before they could even start their torpedo runs. Even if they were able to make a run and release their torpedoes, they then had to run the entire gauntlet again in reverse and try to make their escape. As we had feared, five torpedo planes, including flight leader Tomonaga's and three Zeros were lost. They did, however, knock Yorktown out of action, and a few days later, as she was limping back to Hawaii under her own power, one of our subs finished her off, which was some consolation. On Hiryu, the crews worked furiously to organize a third attack with the only remaining aircraft. This attack group consisted of six Zeros, five dive bombers, and four torpedo planes, the last gasp of our once mighty carrier strike force. However, at 2.30 p.m. that afternoon, 24 enemy dive bombers suddenly came screeching down from out of the sun and scored four direct hits on Hiryu. After giving the order to abandon ship, Captain Tomeo Kaku and Rear Admiral Tamon Yamaguchi went down with the ship and now rest in peace at the bottom of the Eastern Pacific. Our fleet's carriers had now all been annihilated. When word of Hiryu's destruction reached us on the destroyer, we were disconsolate and wandered the decks like lost souls. Only two days before we were the invincible Imperial Japanese Navy now, we were reduced to this. It was all too much to bear, assholes, someone screamed, but his voice was weak, the curse without conviction. As though keeping a death watch, our destroyer spent the day circling Soryu, like a monster in her death throes. From time to time she would belch out huge balls of flame and columns of oily black smoke. When the sun finally slipped below the horizon, it seemed like Soryu would follow. There were just a few clouds floating by on the gentle trades. Transfixed by the grandeur of the scene, we gazed on wordlessly like little children as the sky slowly faded through the hues of sunset. Were it not for the horror of Soryu's burning hulk, it was just another beautiful Pacific evening. Suddenly there was a thunderous explosion, a giant fireball lifted up from the ship, and Soryu slowly began to settle from the bow. The fires must have finally reached the magazine. Some members of the destroyer's crew began quietly singing the mournful song Umiyukaba, and before long everyone had joined in. The song was our way of bidding a final farewell to Captain Yanagimoto and more than 700 of our shipmates. So it was that the carrier Soryu, together with the setting sun, slipped beneath the waves of the eastern Pacific. I felt like I was living a nightmare, but it was all too terribly real to be a dream. Before long night fell over the battlefield, the destroyer's living quarters were crammed with wounded. The medical personnel did the best they could under the circumstances, but they were clearly overwhelmed. The rest of us sat on deck where we expected to spend the night. Soryu and Kaga were now at the bottom of the sea, but the hulk of Akagi was still afloat. She was listing heavily, and from time to time she spat out tongues of bright red flame. Gazing up at the sky, I wondered whether the stars had taken any notice of the ghastly battle that had just taken place. Word had it that Kaga had been hit by three torpedoes from an enemy submarine. This meant that the sub was probably still in the area. The destroyer crew didn't know when they might be attacked, so they couldn't relax their guard. We continued to steam near Akagi at 17 knots, leaving behind us a bright wake that shone in the starlight. This was at about 1am on the morning of June 6th. Eventually we found a spot at the base of one of the guns and drowsed off into a fitful sleep. Suddenly we were awakened by someone shouting, Everybody up, a gun battle's going to start. We all jumped up in alarm. We were told that the enemy fleet was upon us, compared to a carrier a destroyer was a very small ship. Now, with 300 extra people wandering about, it was hard for the crew to man and operate their battle stations. I made my way below decks to the living quarters, where I found a small nook where I could rest. However, after about 30 minutes, the order came to stand down. There was no battle after all. The enemy fleet, if it had ever been there, was no longer in sight. The enemy's report of the battle stated that Soryu's fires had largely gone out and that she was barely making headway when the submarine Nautilus hit her with three torpedoes, sinking her at 4.30 p.m. However, those of us on the destroyer Makigumo were keeping watch over Soryu, and we saw exactly what happened to her. She was dead in the water and we never saw any torpedo hits. Kaga, however, exploded and sank at 4.20 p.m. Akagi evacuated her crew at 4.15 
and the next morning was torpedoed and sunk by one of our destroyers. The first bombs to hit Soryu were from 17 dive bombers launched by the Yorktown. Soryu was not equipped with radar, so similar to the first attack, because our attention was focused on the low-flying torpedo bombers, we never saw the dive bombers coming down out of the sun until it was too late. They caught us napping, as to why we lost the Battle of Midway, there are of course many opinions. The main reason was that the enemy knew of our plans in advance, it seems they had broken our secret codes. Since they knew we were coming, they were well prepared, according to an American counterintelligence officer at the post-war Tokyo trials, we had comprehensive information on the attack. As soon as the combined fleet left the inland sea, we knew just where it was going. We had all the information on its movements. The battle was decided before it was even fought. The second most important reason for the defeat was our poor scouting. On the day of the attack, Kaga and Akagi each launched one attack plane, while the cruisers Ton, Haruna and Chikuma each launched one seaplane, a total of five scout aircraft. However, the plane that flew right past the American fleet and should have seen it said their view was obscured by clouds. Because of their carelessness, the US fleet wasn't located until much later. This shows how crucially important the task of reconnaissance is, and this is something the crew of every airplane should have been well aware of. In a carrier battle every second counts, our delay in locating the enemy was a fatal error. Serious errors were also made by the commanders of the strike force, the order to replace the bombs on the planes with torpedoes was unbelievably ill-advised. Our strike force had 270 aircraft at its disposal. The enemy carriers Yorktown, Enterprise and Hornet were definitely inferior to us in terms of air power. However, they won because they were the first to strike. The disaster was compounded when the cruisers Mogami and Mikuma collided, sending Mikuma to the bottom and seriously damaging Mogami. On June 26, the Imperial Headquarters released the following statement regarding the Battle of Midway. On June 5, the Imperial Naval Forces unleashed a devastating attack on the enemy's base at Midway, and also attacked an American fleet on its way to reinforce the island, inflicting significant losses to the enemy's naval and air forces, and destroying many important land-based facilities. The results of this battle are given below. The American carriers Enterprise and Hornet were sunk, Approximately 20 enemy aircraft were shot down, our losses were one cruiser damaged and 35 airplanes that failed to return. The loss of 35 aircraft was of no real significance, but the deaths of so many highly trained aircrew was a fatal blow to our naval air power. I was quite certain that the effects of these disastrous losses would reverberate throughout the remaining naval battles of the war. On June 24th, the surviving aircrews from Midway, myself included, Arrived at Kanoya Naval Base in Kyushu, we were a pitiful lot defeated, demoralised and with nothing more than the clothes on our backs. Strict orders were given that we were to be kept incommunicado and have no contact or interaction with other personnel on the base. Guards were posted over us to enforce this order and we were kept strictly isolated from everyone else on the base. The purpose of this was to prevent the public from learning about our disastrous defeat at Midway. We were, of course, outraged by this cowardly and despicable behaviour. Plenty of people already knew of the defeat. We couldn't believe that they were treating us so badly. Worse, because we were under what amounted to house arrest, we had no personal belongings of any kind, not even so much as a toothbrush or a washcloth. And of course we had no tobacco. If we had some money we could have bought this stuff. But we didn't have even one sen. We literally had nothing but what we were wearing. I couldn't stand it. So late one night I snuck out of our room, slipped past the guards and made my way to the base barracks. Unbelievably, one of the first people I saw was Warrant Officer Tasukawa, one of my senior classmates from Tateyama Air Base. He was sitting at a table talking with a group of other airmen. I had to find some way to get him to help me. I waved my hand to catch his attention and motioned for him to join me outside. It was pitch dark out there so there was no way the guards could see us. Hey, Mori, what are you doing here? Yeah, it's been a while, but we can talk later. How about a smoke? What the hell happened to you? You look like you are starving or something. He handed me a homar cigarette and I grabbed it greedily, lit it up and inhaled deeply. After going so long without a smoke, it tasted so wonderful it made me feel dizzy. We got here yesterday, but we have got absolutely no personal belongings. Can you help us out? What do you want? Tobacco, washcloths, toilet paper? 
Okay, wait here. After a few minutes he was back. Here, Mori, take this Imonbukuro. Hey, thanks a lot. I really appreciate this. Although the Imonbukuro was almost certainly sent to him by his family, he gave it to me without even having opened it. This unexpected kindness from someone of senior rank almost brought me to tears. I will pay you back for this, I promise. What are you talking about? Samurai have to help each other out. Don't worry about it. Better get back before they notice you missing. Okay, thanks again. I will share this with the rest of the men. I tucked the Imon Bukoro under my arm and snuck back to our quarters. When I opened the bag, I found two towels, three packs of caramels, three cans of fish, a bar of soap and ten packs of cigarettes. Hey guys, we got a care package. In a few moments, ten or twelve men were standing around me in anticipation. Wow, that's fantastic, said one of them. Anybody got a can opener? Someone pulled a rusty old can opener from the pocket of flight suit and we went to work on the canned fish. Dinner is served, said someone gleefully. We fell to like starving men, relishing the taste of home for the first time after many weeks at sea. The cigarettes were then doled out three to a man and we all went outside for a smoke. After enduring this unnatural isolation for almost two weeks, the names of those being sent to air groups on the main islands were posted. This came as a surprise because we had been thinking that they would probably replace us with a completely new group to give us time to recover from the physical and emotional shock of the defeat. Instead, those of us from Soryu were kept together and reconstituted as a smaller unit consisting of nine attack aircraft. This unit was assigned to Junyo, a passenger liner converted to a carrier. On June 6th, Junyo had seen her first action in the northern operation. A magnificent ship displacing 24,140 tons. Her complement of aircraft included 18 Zeros, 18 dive bombers, and 9 torpedo bombers. It looked like the only way I was going to get relieved of carrier duty was to get killed or wounded. If that's the way it's going to be, I thought, I might as well just keep on doing my job. Those of us chosen for the new unit said goodbye to our former comrades in arms and went off to the base at Kasanohara. Since we were a new unit, we had no airplanes and no maintenance personnel. Eventually we got organised and began training and working up to operational status. The problem was our section leader, First Lieutenant Ito, because he had no combat experience. He had no idea how to lead us. His leadership skills were so lousy that if he took us into combat, we would all be shot down by the Grummans before we could release a single torpedo. The men didn't hesitate to voice their displeasure. With his skills at best, he could be the number three plane in the formation. He may be wearing three stars, but he's hopeless as a leader. This isn't a peacetime unit we are putting together here. We are going to the front soon. We have been through the hell of Midway and he hasn't even seen combat. Finally, we all decided that we had to do something about it, so two of us non-coms had a frank talk with Lieutenant Ito. We told him that with respect to the target, the squadron should be deployed at a distance of 30,000 feet, and that when manoeuvring in formation, he should concentrate less on his own position and more on those following him. In closing, we said, we understand that it must be difficult for you to lead experienced combat pilots like us. But while it is rude for us to say this, the way you are doing things now is very dangerous and we cannot stay in formation with you. The reaction of most officers to such frank criticism would be a tirade of screaming about us not showing proper respect, not knowing our place, etc. Fortunately for us, Lieutenant Ito was an exception to the rule, I see, he said thoughtfully. I had not even thought about that, of course. You men have more experience than me and are better pilots. Still, I am the officer in charge, so I have to fulfil my duty as such. I cannot just say I do not have the requisite experience and let you take charge. Let's do this. Together, we will discuss the best way of doing things, but I will retain my position as the group's leader. His conciliatory words moved me so deeply that I was on the verge of tears. I actually had to avert my face to hide my emotions in the end. Although I felt somewhat guilty for having spoken so frankly, I was now determined to support him wholeheartedly. A huge weight was lifted from my shoulders, and I felt that I could die following a leader like this without regret. This experience taught me that human emotions are moved not by skill or wisdom, and certainly not by stratagem. Affection or love of our fellow man is what motivates us. Shortly after this, Lieutenant Ito began holding study sessions with us. In these sessions, we could talk freely, 
and everyone was encouraged to speak their mind. We soon began to feel guilty about all the nasty things we had said earlier. We are lucky to have such a good flight leader, said someone, expressing an opinion shared by all. These study sessions were held at regular intervals, and they proved to be very effective. The battleship Musashi joined the fleet, and the crews began training in earnest. Those of us in the torpedo planes also trained in the bomber role. One day, the staff officers of Musahi paid a visit to Kasanohara to observe our training and talk with us. It seemed that the Ito torpedo bomber group was beginning to attract attention. During our training at the base, Lieutenant Commander Masatake Okumiya, now a member of the general staff of the second air group, accompanied an inspection tour of our base. Lieutenant Commander Okumiya was my former flight leader at Kasumigara, and it was great to see him again. When I heard he was at our base, I immediately made my way to the operations centre and practically yelled out, Staff Officer Okumiya, Pilot Mori is in good health and working hard. Oh, Mori, glad to see you are doing well. Now that I am on the staff here, we will be working together. His friendly words made me feel very happy, 